What's up guys, Ian Sandusky from Let's Machine, back here again for Practical Machinist. Today on Shop Talk for our special holiday episode, we're gonna be talking about things to consider when you're thinking about putting a new machine on your floor. At the end of this episode, we're gonna be announcing our big holiday giveaway winners, so make sure you guys stay tuned to the whole episode to check that. Let's get into it. Okay guys, so today we're gonna to be talking about the top things you wanna think about and consider when you're thinking about putting a new machine on your floor. Now, first and foremost, it is incredibly difficult to keep track of everything that's coming out these days with machining. You know, from five axis machining to things like uh, double spindle machining, where you know, you'll have a lathe where it has two spindles, it'll turn it on one side, then come grab it with another spindle, do it on the other. There's live tool stuff, there's, uh, what is it called, cryogenic machining, where you can have a mill like this, but instead of using coolant, it's putting little bursts of liquid nitrogen into that contact surface where the part is. And then there's additive machining, you know, there's all the new uh, sintered metal machining, all that kind of stuff. So it's very easy to get overwhelmed with all the new technology coming out all the time and thinking about where it could fit in in your shop and the kind of things you wanna learn and the kind of things you wanna get into. So the first things, that I like to consider when I'm thinking about putting a new machine on the floor is I need to add either a new capability or add new capacity that I can use immediately. And the reason this is important is that if I have, let's say my shop here, if you guys have taken the shop tour, which you guys can by going to the link in, uh, in the Practical Machinist website there to see all the shop tour videos, but you'll know that I have four mills and a lathe. If I have four mills that are all the exact same size, let's say I have four Haas VF2s, I'm very limited in what I can do. I have a very set work area, I have a very set set of tools I can use, I have a very set amount of approaches I can do. So instead, what we try to do is always bring in a different machine that can add a capability. For instance, either a machine that has a bigger table or a machine that has you know a better tool changer, a higher speed spindle, Something that's gonna allow us to do a little bit more than what we can do right now, but not something completely outside of our wheelhouse if I'm looking for something like that. For instance, I'm putting in a brand new uh, Haas VF4 SS to replace my old VF4, which is aging and becoming a problem. That way I'm gonna have a higher speed spindle, I'm gonna increase my capacity, but also I'm not getting way out into the weeds. And the reason for that is this. There's a huge drive, I think, with all the new technology coming out to always be adding new capabilities without maybe looking at the market that's there. And that's why I say, if you're adding capacity, you need to make sure you can utilize it immediately. Um, here's a little story for you. Back in the day, let's say this is 15 years ago, we opened up a side business here at Lakewood called Lakewood Technical Services. And what Lakewood Technical Services did is we bought another unit, we put in a you know room size CMM machine, and the aim was that we were going to CMM parts for other businesses. It lasted for about a year. And although it was a brilliant machine, uh, the operator who was responsible for it was really good at what he did. There just wasn't a local market for it. We didn't have a demand around us for that kind of function and for that kind of work. And for that reason, it failed. We ended up selling it off, wrapping it up and all that, you know, ended up not going anywhere. So before you go and you add something like, let's say a laser engraver, because you know what, you've always wanted a laser engraver. You can think of all the fun stuff you can do with it. You have to make sure there's a local market for it. Um, if I add a laser engraver in that can do, you know, four axis laser engraving, and it turns out there's only one other place that really needs laser engraving around me, no matter how good I am at it, unless I somehow have a global reach for this one laser machine, people are always already gonna have that capability filled somewhere near them. Um, unless you're spending millions and millions of dollars to get a machine that nobody in your country has, you know, you have to make sure that there is a local market for what you're doing. Another good example of this would be 3D printing. Um, 3D printing, when it really kind of blew up about 10 years ago, I remember every shop around here was putting in a 3D printer, thinking that it would, you know, give them another revenue stream, give them another capability that they don't currently have. And it turned out that 3D printers, just straight, you know, 3D printing with plastic or, you know, ABS, I don't really use them, I'm not sure, but not the super fancy ones, regular 3D printing, there isn't a huge market out there for 3D printers because in an industrial setting because small 3D printers are cheap so people can print their own parts at home 
big crazy 3D printers that can do metal and you know additive machining that way they have an industrial purpose but these kind of middle range 3D printers the only real application they have that's kind of come out of it is you know making little parts for your own machines or prototyping um, so a lot of people ended up with 3D printers that they can't really monetize and I'm sure they found use for them and people love them and so on and so forth but there was never a local market identified for it people just really jumped on the technology and said you know what we could probably make money at this, let's use it. So making sure that there is a local market for your stream that you're gonna go, you know, whether it's straight turning, whatever it may be, is critical before you put a new machine on the floor. Another thing to consider is maintenance and ease of parts. So let's say I wanna get a new machine. I tend to run one kind of machine. The reason I run this brand of machine is that I find it very easy to get parts. I find it very easy to get service. There are a lot of old ones, so not only do I have the primary market to get machine, uh, machine parts, sometimes I can get used parts, I can get spare parts, I can get, you know, not OEM parts. If you're buying a machine that you're getting a good deal on, there may be a reason you're getting a good deal on it because it's very difficult to find parts or service. Um, there are more kinds of CNC machines out there under the sun than ever before, and some of them have really great supply chain lines. Other Others are small companies that somebody might have bought, brought this machine in from overseas, and you may never be able to find a part for it because that company may have folded the next day. So doing your homework and making sure that not only can you get that machine on the floor, know how to run it, whatever it may be, being able to get parts for that machine is gonna determine whether that machine may be at your shop for 30 years, like some of our machines have almost been, or for five years because that's when it breaks down, you can't fix it, and you're stuck with a boat anchor. So making sure you do your homework on the machine that way is important. The other thing to consider is what kind of programming language, tool holders, all that kind of stuff is compatible with your shop. As you guys know, there's a lot of different kinds of tool holder uh, variants and stuff. You know, this is a Cat 40. If you're buying a machine that looks great and has great capabilities and so on and so forth, but doesn't fit with the kind of tooling, the kind of holders, even the kind of software or posts that your um, software uses, you're gonna have a huge adaptation to getting that machine working. And then at the end of the day, I mean, we have, for example, we have a machine that can only use floppy disks, so we switched it to a V floppy. But at the end of the day, you have to think completely differently when you're gonna go just put a program on that machine than you do the other ones. And it adds a stumbling block and it adds another point of failure. You want something that's as compatible as possible with your work style, with the things you have in-house already to make it fit seamlessly. The contrast to this is if you have machines you don't really like and you want to move in a different direction away from what you have, that's fine too. But make sure that the rest of that company or that kind of machine's portfolio fits with what you're trying to do and work towards so you can replace it towards it as the year goes on. Otherwise, you're going to have this white elephant in your shop that doesn't really match anything else and it's just going to create a stumbling block for you for years. And I've dealt with the situation. It's annoying and at times has cost me money. So these are all things to think about. The last thing to think about is thinking about buying used or new. Buying used is always gonna save you money. Um, you know, it's, the, machines are a lot like cars in that when they leave the lot, their value instantly goes down. So you're gonna be able to pick one up cheaper than you can new. But the problem is, is unless you're using something like the Up app and something has a full service history with it, you may not know how many hours that machine really has, whether something's been reset. You don't know how many crashes that machine has had. You don't know if that machine works really well for a month because they switched out one part that they know that machine burns out for some reason because it's just a lemon. And you're gonna have that same issue for years. So try to consider whether you wanna spend the extra money buying something new and having that peace of mind that at least you have the service there for it and the warranty versus you know potentially being able to get a better deal on a used machine. These are things to all weigh out to try to figure out what machine and what timing is best for you. And my biggest advice for it is to be patient, take your time and always run down this kind of list of things before you commit to anything because it's easy to buy something. Sometimes it's very difficult to get rid of something that's causing a headache. Okay. Thank you very much for watching guys. We're going to list the holiday winners now. So if you have won and I announce your name, you need to email info, I-N-F-O at practicalmachinist.com to claim it. Again, that's info at practicalmachinist.com. So here are the names. Congratulations to Jamie Shibley. That's Jamie Shibley. Nick King, Jacob Collins, and Dennis Griffin. Again, one more time. That's Jamie Shibley, Nick King, Jacob Collins, 
and Dennis Griffin. If you have won, make sure you have to email info at practicalmachinist.com to claim your prize. Thanks to everybody who entered. It was great to see all your comments on that video. If you like this video and you want to see more, make sure you like and subscribe below. Thank you very much. You take care, guys. Have a great day.